the chair of the next session, um, Susan Wawelski, unfortunately is not able to make it, so I have been asked to stand in. Hugh Cormican uh, from company Serdan. And I'm joined a panel of four people here. And we're very interested in talking about the issue of patient to patients, you know, uh, about the speed of innovation in healthcare, which has been an issue and it's going to be something of, of interest for all of us. Uh, maybe I first of all ask uh, our panel just to introduce themselves. Uh, maybe if I start, just briefly, uh, Miriam is the Chief Diagnostics Officer for Oaken, which I believe is a data analytics company focused on finding the right treatment for patients. But if you want to give a quick introduction to yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Miriam Sefta. So, I am Chief Diagnostics Officer at Oaken. Uh, so, it's a, we're a young uh, company now. You would uh, qualify it as a scale-up. We were founded uh, six years ago. And our mission is to use artificial intelligence and data analysis in the field of biomedical research to improve uh, finding the right treatment for the right patient. Uh, and uh, we're in particular focused on oncology. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next, I have uh, Jonathan O'Toole, who is the chief product design person for LV, which I believe are developing products for women, actually thinking about what the women need. <laughs> yeah. Uh, finally, which is a good thing. Um, so yeah, we focus on Femtech, which are kind of relatively new, which is shocking, um, but it's uh, focusing on kind of building the tools that women need to kind of have better control over their health journey. Um, so predominantly, we focus around pelvic floor health and breastfeeding and pumping at the moment, uh, but expanding it out to kind of take a wider approach to all female healthcare and female tech products, but with a kind of very consumer lens versus a medical lens, but we are medical products. Very good. And next we have um, Alison Liddy, who is a co-founder of Relivium. Um, they're working on developing and tackling knee osteoarthritis. Is that right? Um, yeah, I'm Alison Liddy. I'm CEO and co-founder of Relivium. Uh, Relivium is a spin-out, Menu I Go Away, and it's developing a novel biotherapeutic for knee osteoarthritis. So one of the biggest problems with osteoarthritis um, is that patients are heavily reliant on oral medication. So this is an injectable treatment that's injected directly into the knee and hopefully will um, reduce patients' reliance on oral medication, which has serious side effects and is not suitable for long-term use. Yeah, and uh, after the walk up uh, Ergel tomorrow, maybe you might get a few more people to come and talk to you. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the other panelist I have is uh, Daryl Charles, who's from the School of Computing, Ulster University. I believe you are background in computer computational intelligence, AI and VR. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Daryl Charles from the, the um, University of Ulster. Um, I'm a bit of a geek. I'm into all sorts of technology, so AI, machine learning, game development, virtual reality. Um, I'm also a co-founder of uh, Spinout, uh, just spun out last year, Exert Intelligent Healthcare, and we specialize in virtual reality systems for upper um, limb stroke rehabilitation. Um, so, interesting. Very good. And you know, our, our discussion today is really about how we can bring innovation faster to patients. This is something that's been very close to my heart. Uh, I was originally a founder, as you heard, of a company that was involved in research imaging and developing a lot of new technology. And after a number of years there, I wanted to move on and go other places. And one of the areas I felt really is how I could bring some of those new exciting innovation developments into healthcare. And Certainly, um, how we could expedite that and speed and accelerate that, which has always been an issue. So, I'm um, interested, just maybe we should look at this in relation to pre COVID, um, peri COVID, and post COVID to see really what's been the issues. So, I, I'm sort of interested in what your views about where you've seen the issues of um, why, why is it still quite often a difficult task to get technology and innovation into treating patients and patient care? Is it the regulatory authorities? Is it the clinicians being blockers? Is it the, um, the, just the slow tempo of pharmaceutical companies? What do you think? Maybe Alison, you nodding first. Um, yeah, I, okay, I think one of the biggest things for an early stage company is obviously funding. Um, but blocking, obviously, regulatory is a massive lift. You have to show that your product is very safe. 
um, that can be very difficult. You're going through phase two trials, 300 patients, and if your trial isn't well designed, you fail your trial, you can run out of funding, and that can be the end of it. So there's, there's lots of obstacles. And sometimes clinicians do block products, um, particularly if it's gonna impact their revenue, and that would be very relevant to the US market where that is, you know, healthcare is very driven by, um, you know, profits. And John, have you the experience of having to deal with regular issues? And yeah, a little bit. Um, I suppose we, we're kind of quite unique where we're taking kind of quite stigmatized and taboo subjects, um, which are quite interesting. You know, when we go for funding, and you're talking about pelvic floor health, um, typically to a white male kind of group of people that you're trying to ask for money, that it's kind of a lot of shaking of the heads and kind of, uh, it's a bit, it's a bit, you know, niche of a market. It's like it's 51 percent of the population. Like, that's not niche. But you know, we've, and it's kind of like you know, you feel like you have to justify it, which is just a bit weird. Um, you know, you've got Apple Healthcare that launched without um, cycle tracking and stuff like that. So I think for for us, when we think about our products, there's lots of barriers to overcome. Just normalising the conversation to a point that we can then kind of move forward. Um, so we do have regulation barriers because a lot of what we do is it's on the edge of consumer health and medical. So pelvic floor, floor device is kind of its category creation. So if you go to the FDA and you say, well, what is it? They kind of look back at you and go, maybe a sex toy? And you're like, it's not. And then they're like, well, we've kind of got nothing to fit this into. Um, so then you have to go through 513 Gs and they're like, well, we can't really categorize it, but that's the whole process for this. So I think, you know, trying to get funding, trying to even have conversations with the experts is quite difficult, depending on what category you're going to. Existing categories are hard, new categories and stigmatized categories are even harder again to try to get a bit of traction when you're starting out. Yeah, and um, Miriam, I, I, you're obviously involved with AI work, and uh, do you find that, that maybe a lot of clinicians don't really understand it as, as a blocker to? normal that um, you know regulators will obviously follow innovations more than be the lead in uh, uh, on these innovations um, and they are here for a reason to kind of protect uh, the general population from being exposed to uh, innovations that haven't uh, been properly tested and evaluated that being said, what we're seeing is uh, kind of an acceleration of that innovation and the use of new methods, uh, you know, AI, new, new types of products. And so I think that's a challenge definitely for innovators to kind of catch up and build uh, systems that are fast and flexible enough uh, to be able to evaluate those uh, products. And then on the payer side as well, at least in the European setting, we're in a mostly uh, socialized um, uh, healthcare payment setting. And so you actually need to prove to healthcare authorities that your product brings long-term value in terms of quality of life, in terms of survival, in terms of overall health. And um, there are a lot of uh, innovators that are uh, kind of putting out uh, their, their products, but actually building those studies to prove rigorously that your product actually has, um, you know, short, medium, long-term impact is very expensive. It's very time-consuming, and if you don't design it right, uh, then you can uh, basically lose your entire company because you put all your money in building this one study to prove that your product uh, does have that impact. Yeah, and m m moving on now to during the COVID era, I mean, innovation and the speed of innovation seemed to have moved up several gears, almost like a, a war footing where people really need to focus. Um, you know, there was Formula One um, engineers developing ventilators. There was, um, did you feel, Daryl, there was a lot more connectivity between the clinicians and, and, and the researchers and innovators during COVID? That there definitely was a push for that. And I know in Stoke Rehab, um, certainly in the, in the Dublin area, for example, there was, there was funding put in place to, to connect to patients. Um, it's something that's really important um, because um, people are living longer and also getting early discharge from hospital. Um, so, you know, the lessons learned during COVID can help us to, you know, get better health tech, get better connectivity um, to the, you know, between the clinicians, our doctors, and their patients. Um, 
And one of the challenges is that we, you know, we have several customers. You know, we've got you know, the healthcare organization, which has a kind of an economic or like a bigger picture. And you've got your healthcare you know, practitioners who are very much you know, trying to optimize their, their work um, and improve their performance. And, and then you've got the customer, obviously, who very often is left on their own at the moment because you know, we don't have enough money to, to deliver what they need in terms of um, human resource. So, yeah, there has been, a, I think there's been an, an increase in um, communication, but I think we're still a, a little bit off where we should be. Anybody else any experience during COVID that they found things different? Or? Um, I, I wasn't, but I have seen some really great success stories come out of Galway and NUI Galway and collaboration with large indigenous companies there as well. Um, but that wasn't my area and I was kind of had to stay out of the hospital, unfortunately. I think the, the interesting thing for me over the last while is that that speed of innovation has only worked because there's, there's a really well known problem that we're all trying to solve and we're trying to do it collectively. I think speed of innovation when you've got a lack of a problem that you're trying to solve or you're working in a community together can be distracting because you're not spending enough time listening to what is actually needed. So there's a, a lot of rapid innovation, but maybe not in the right areas. And we've seen that time and time again in kind of more of the, the healthcare ways of working is that we don't listen enough to actually what we're trying to solve. And we're trying to push technology at people. Um, whereas this was quite unique because it was the perfect environment where everyone knew the problem that we were trying to solve and everyone wanted to come together to solve it. So that rapid response is really important when you've got those two things. If you don't have those two things rapid, it's kind of, it can just create a bit of noise. And I mean, obviously now what we'd like to do is keep that speed of innovation. Now we're in a post-COVID era. Any, any thoughts about how we can keep that momentum there and keep that accelerated uh, connection with uh, you know, getting you know, technology innovative work to patients. Any, any thoughts about how we need to go about that? Um, well, so at, uh, in my company, we did a project on uh, during the, the, the lockdown on, on COVID, and we got it up and running in, in record time compared to all of our other projects. But we also know that we were able to do this because the hospitals that we collaborate with had explicit instructions to deprioritize everything else and to put all of their time and energy in pushing these uh, COVID projects at the door. And so I think that while there is a lot of um, you know, private money and uh, startups and innovators uh, pushing for innovations, I think that what's often lacking is the bandwidth from uh, these healthcare institutions to collaborate with all these people who have you know, who are bubbling with ideas and innovations. And um, oftentimes, uh, for example, the clinician is the number one person that you wanna collaborate with. And these people are extremely um, constrained in time and they never have enough time to be able to collaborate between um, running their, um, their hospital service, uh, actually treating patients and collaborating with industry. Uh, I think it's, it's that question of bandwidth on their end that is often uh, lacking. It's so, so often in business, it's, it's the trade-off between you know, taking time out to do strategic work to benefit, to, to reduce the work they have to do on a day-to-day -day or business as usual function. And so if the government can help them, give them some free more time for strategic work, that would probably be the biggest thing that would help us keep the, the speed of innovation. A any other thoughts? Uh, as Freddie mentioned, fu uh, funding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, funding is always an issue, you know, especially, it's, I mean, health tech is a very expensive, you know, business and, you know, developing, connecting to people during the trials, as already mentioned, so um, access and maybe a little bit of um, more faith. Um, um, it was mentioned earlier on today that, you know, perhaps some funders need to fail a little bit more often. So I know that some of the investors we talk to seem to be quite, adver quite av you know, averse to to risk, so it's within something within our you're, sphere. you're looking for maybe like government grant support or and how do you think that should be structured? Should that be sort of based on collaboration with clinicians or should that be, you know, something because you know unless we get that connection with those you know clinicians to the patients, it's going to be very difficult. Um, or how do you see that? There is, there is, a, I think there is a trend towards this, you know, which is good, you know, where you know the, the in the in the UK and in the NHS, they for example. They, have, um, they do have some funds that can open, open access to you know, care pathways. Uh, and I think that's really important. It's critical, actually. 
Yeah. No, there's no, no point in, in developing technology in a one vacuum, so I agree. As we head into economic trade winds, you know, no, no doubt funding and, and, and money will always be at a premium here, so it's more important we ask for a really focused, you know, where that money can be best benefit to us. So, you know, funding, is there any other thoughts people have in terms of... Um, just on the point made here as well, I would say getting access to clinicians. So even as an early stage company, obviously large pharmaceutical companies can pay and get a group of clinicians together. But, you know, to get a large group of clinicians and patients and see, get their inputs um, through organised groups and hospitals. And often a lot of hospitals are affiliated with the university. Um, would make a difference and that's exactly what happened during COVID. You know, people were willing to give up their time and do it, but to keep that momentum and innovation, particularly with if, if it's the developer, not the business person, I think direct contact with the clinician is key for the person who's developing the product because often it's missed when you're relying on a product manager or somebody to feed it back in, you know, you, you, what they have, what's been communicated to them can often be, you know, very different than what gets back to the developer. So I think direct groups between product developers and the, uh, the stakeholders is really important. Yeah, you, you, you're obviously from Galway, so there's quite a lot of uh, big healthcare, health tech companies around there. Do you, do you feel that they are supportive enough of, of the small innovators and, and collaborate enough with them to help, you know, because they, obviously they're invested and, and it's good for them if there's a good infrastructure beyond their own business? I mean, do you think that that's good enough or is it something that needs to be done there as well? Um, I think it is. I mean, I think the multinationals definitely play a role, but I think for the early stage companies, you're always looking for something they don't have, you know, so you are looking to find a niche in their area or do something that disrupts there that they'd be interested in that product. So I think they do play a part. Obviously, they have credibility you know, if you're looking particularly for an international investor that you can reference all these large multinationals that are based in Galway and are part of the ecosystem. Um, but I think for early stage companies, you know, you are, you can get their input, but you are actually on your own in a lot of cases. That you, and, and, you know, you're, a lot of companies are afraid to share their tech too early until their patents are filed and they really have tied down the technology. Um, any, any other thoughts then on how we can keep this speed and innovation going? I mean, to encourage the next generation of innovators coming through, I mean, where do you think we need to focus on? Is it through universities or is it people in the, in the companies, in the pharmaceutical companies who maybe want to sort of take another tack in their, in their careers and, and move to set up their own companies? Um, I would say just support the ecosystem. So Galway is a great example through BioInnovate. It's a fellowship in the university where people can leave industry, go back in, you know, spin out, secure funding, and grow a company from there. Um, then from that, there's later stage, you know, entrepreneurs that have had successes. So I think it's really starting at the beginning and supporting the ecosystem from there right up to that multinational. Um, and also in NUI, NUI Goa at the moment, they have a great, um, you know, setup for young entrepreneurs through the Ideas Lab, um, which is also really important as well that... Um, for undergraduates, not just for experienced um, people. I think it's, you know, right across the board because everybody's got ideas and, you know, it's been proven that at any age you can create a company and a business, you know, with a good idea. I, I take it, Jonathan, you're probably a guy after going hard here. You also believe that the fundamental to this is talking to the people with the pain points, the, the, you know, the patient, the clinician. What is it you need to talk to? Yeah, we, we start, so our innovation process, we, we just talk to people. We don't try to, we try to figure out the problem that we're, sol we're trying to solve and then go about that. And I think through that, then we start the development process and try to apply the technology. So all we start with a user is really important for us. I think you mentioned a really critical word there of that ecosystem. I think a lot of the companies that are even here today or, you know, are in Galway, they're not in direct competition with each other and actually understanding that, that user may have now had a digital experience and have quite good information that leads between all these companies is like, is there a future where all these companies are actually in partnership? Because I think what people aren't benefiting at the, mo at the moment from is because there's lots of companies doing lots of things. It's hard to access the right pathways at the right times. And I think actually some consolidation of some pathways 
are going to allow for a better patient outcome and also allow for some of these companies to flourish and actually be able to, to help patients quicker and give people a better experience and empower because that's ultimately by digitizing all of this you hopefully can help people faster and give people empowerment to do that so i think yeah start with the user and actually some consolidation within the ecosystem would be great so and you know for those innovators out there have you any uh, last closing thoughts about what is it that really advice to them about what they should should do here? I just say speak to all your stakeholders. Obviously, we're in health tech. Um, for me, speaking to patients kind of changed, I suppose, just our emotional um, attitude to the product. So we obviously knew there was a big need in osteoarthritis. And I think most healthcare companies say everything they do, they do for the patient. But until you actually meet patients and you hear human stories, um, you know, that makes a whole you know, gives you an emotional connection to really what you're doing because it's ups and downs. And um, that for me was really, really important. So speak to all your stakeholders that are involved and associated with your product. Any advice, Marion? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very good point, especially since I was um, thinking there's, a, there's a, sometimes a mismatch between the funding and the innovations that are put in specific therapeutic areas and the burden of those therapeutic areas on the overall population. So, you know, if you think that a lot of innovators are young, they might be thinking about specific diseases more uh, than others, and it might be skewed uh, compared to how those diseases are actually impacting the overall population. So I think that uh, making that, like, emotional connection with diseases uh, and therapeutic areas that they might not be familiar with, I think will create innovations in areas that are currently under, um, understudied. Any thoughts? Maybe it's more a general thing for life, but you know, <laughs> certainly in terms of innovation, um, take risks. Don't let people put you down, <laughs> and uh, don't be afraid to fail. If if you don't fail, you don't learn. Really, you know, you don't learn from success as much as you learn from failure. So, yeah, I think you know we've talked about emotional connection to those patients and those people i think it's super critical like in the uk at the moment you like you take yourself back 10 years you used to have about an hour with a doctor before in consultation now you've got four minutes um so they call it the door the doorknob question of when you're just about to leave the question that you really want to ask comes out at the very very end um, just imagine yourself in those and when you're designing and trying to build that experience, start from that kind of moment because I think you, you get real impact that way. Um, so I think, yeah, if you spend enough time with the users, you can really build compelling stuff. And once you build that investment and everything else comes a little bit easier, if you don't have that dialed in straight on, it's kind of harder to tell your stories, it's harder to get investment, it's harder to do everything else. So knowing what you're trying to solve and how you're going to go about it is really, really critical. Very good. And um, just in general, I don't know if we're much time left. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, I, I remember uh, innovators under 35, I think the key advice here is, is to go for it and make sure you take the risks and manage it. I remember not too long ago, it seems like a, just yesterday, I was on a list of 30 people to watch for under, under 30s. I'm, I'm now looking to see if there's, a, you know, the 100 to watch under 100. <laughs> so. It seems like just yesterday, so um, take your opportunities, and there's never been a better environment for innovation and for getting out there and, and providing innovation companies. And for the same for innovation in healthcare, and there's some really good people here to connect with, and, and if you get a chance, talk to them about how their experiences can help your experiences, particularly in healthcare, and how you can innovate, where it really matters, and bringing benefits to patients, and improving their well-being, and improving healthcare for everybody. So thank you, everybody, and thank you for the panel. Thank you. Thank you.